Top House Republicans are tonight formally calling for a second special counsel. House Oversight Chairman Trey Gowdy of South Carolina and Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte of Virginia say a new investigation, an independent one, is needed to look into abuses of FISA surveillance during and after the 2016 election. Joe DeGeneva is a former U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and he joins us tonight. So, Joe, are you, just bottom line it, you know a lot about special counsels. Are you for this or no? Absolutely. Uh, it has to happen because the inspector general to whom this investigation has been given has no subpoena power. He has no authority to interview anybody outside the Department of Justice or FBI. He cannot even interview FBI and DOJ employees who have left. He cannot interview Clapper, Brennan, any of the people associated with it. He can't interview all the people that have left, Yates, all those people. So the bottom line is you have to have a grand jury. Uh, it's fascinating. We have a grand jury and a special counsel in Russiagate where there's been no crime committed. And here with the FISA violations where there have been huge numbers of crimes committed by various people in various departments. We have no grand jury. So part of the, the reason you have a special counsel is to restore public faith in the system itself. It seems yeah. to me making public the FISA requests for the warrants would go a long way to ending the debate over all this. Can that happen? Will it happen? Uh, it should happen. I cannot conceive of anything that is in those affidavits that would uh, that would compromise sources and methods. Uh, it's ludicrous that they haven't been released. They should be released. The American people have a right to see them because remember, Tucker, what this is all about, and FISA is just part of it. There was a brazen plot. ...to it. Um, so FBI agent Peter Strzok, who still works at the Bureau, I think, in human resources, uh, may have known about a breach of Hillary Clinton's private email server, but apparently didn't do anything about it. Sources have told Fox News that during the final months of the FBI's investigation into Hillary Clinton's server, irregularities in the server's metadata were found, and that indicated a potential breach. Strzok, who was overseeing that investigation, took no action in response, according to our sources. Maybe he was too busy sending anti-Trump text messages to his mistress or whatever. How, I mean, does that seem out of the ordinary to you? It's absolutely out of the ordinary. And here's what happened on top of that. James Clapper, who was the director of national intelligence yes. under Obama, when he found out that Hillary Clinton's server had been compromised, they are required by law to conduct, to conduct a damage assessment to see whether or not sources and methods have been compromised. He refused, Clapper refused to do a damage assessment, and that is why Strzok decided not to investigate the compromise of Hillary's server. On what grounds did Clapper, who by the way is the same one who under oath lied to Congress and the public about spying on Americans, on what grounds did he refuse to do a damage assessment? Because he wanted to protect Hillary and he could do it and he had the consent of the president not to do an assessment. And by that I mean the consent of President Obama. Wow, that's pretty shocking. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Thank you, Tucker. Well, a group of physicians are calling on doctors to shame gun exception. Her show has only one topic, how everyone who disagrees with her is a racist. She's not a civil rights act advocate. She's just a monomaniac. Take a look. It's been no secret that Trump harbors racist attitudes about brown and black people in the U.S. and other parts of the world. We're just another Western nation falling to the ethno-nationalist forces sweeping across Europe, feeding on the fear of non-white and non-Christian immigrants. Trump ushers in an emboldened KKK and an alt-right that will soon have a place in the White House. We grapple every day with what it means to have a president stained by racism. Well, that's the whole show, really. Every week, so there's no need for you to watch. So you might be tempted. But when you're Joy Reid, the answer to every question, no matter what it is, bigotry! The only variable is volume. This past weekend, she melted down completely over a joke the president told about Nancy Pelosi. Watch. He reportedly also said that uh, Nancy Pelosi has been trying to come up with a line as good as lock her up. And that her line, says Donald Trump, that she announced last week is mow the grass. Mow the freaking grass. That isn't going to stop MS-13. Mow that freaking grass. That sounds like uh, an aspersion or a, 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 sla a slap at uh, immigrants, at, at Mexican-Americans. At least that's how I'm reading it. 
<laughs> At least that's how I'm reading it. Of course, you're reading it that way. Of course, back in reality, Trump was just ridiculing Pelosi over a proposal that the border can be kept secure with proper lawn care. We all have a responsibility to protect our borders. Should there be fencing? Should there be technology? Should, be, should they mow the grass so that people can't hide in it? Let's talk about where the, a more serious structure might be necessary, where fencing will do, or mowing the grass so that people can't be smuggled through the grass. <laughs> so is Pelosi the secret grand wizard? We'll see if Joy Reid denounces her. I'm sure she'll denounce us too. Can't wait. Tucker. So um, I, I was reading about this, and you all said um, over at the annals that the massacre in Las Vegas spurred you to do this. Um, and it got me thinking, would this have prevented that? Do you think if you had told Stephen Paddock that guns are dangerous, that he wouldn't have opened fire? No, and that's not exactly what our proposal um, is. Our proposal is to treat firearm injury like a public health problem that it has become. And mm -hmm. one opportunity to do that is for in the exam room for doctors to talk to their patients who are at risk for injuring themselves or others with guns about how to um, deal with it more safely. So, but you're not an expert on guns. I mean, would it make you uncomfortable if I gave you medical advice? Um, yeah, that would make me pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, me too. Her, That's why I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm not an expert on guns, but I am a medical expert. And part of what physicians do is to assess risk and then help talk to their patients about mitigating those risks. Oh, assess risk. Like when you guys sent tens of millions of doses of opioids into Appalachia and killed over 100,000 people, that, that kind of risk. Uh, Where were you then? Just, just wondering. I can't uh, help it since you bragged about your risk assessment abilities. Well, risk assessment, we do assess risk, and it wasn't doctors that sent tens of million doses of opioids yes, to Appalachia or other places, but we do assess risk. We assess risks of um, high blood pressure, smoking, uh, risky sexual behavior that puts people at risk for infections. Right. Uh, when people are elderly and at risk for falls, we ask about area rugs in the home. We talk to patients mm -hmm. about seatbelts. There are lots of different risks that we assess. And this uh, proposal is, that, is to remind physicians that when they have a patient who's at risk for harming themselves or others, to ask about whether they have guns in the home and then talk to them about more safely storing those guns or other interventions that can make them and their family safer. What would, uh, would you acknowledge that there are people who ought to have a gun in the home? Like if you live alone in a tough area where there's a lot of crime, home invasions, would you ever say, you know, you, it's probably better to have some way to defend yourself? I, as a physician, I would not, uh, I don't think that that would be in my purview to do. I mean, it's certainly people's right in this country. Um, but if that person was at risk of harming themselves or others, then I would be counseling them that maybe it would not be safe to have a gun in their But home. what if they were at risk of being harmed? I mean, if, you're, if the point of this is harm reduction, as you claimed it was, then, I mean, if someone was a delivery man, for example, in a tough neighborhood delivering the newspaper or delivering to bodegas at 3 well, in the morning, actually, wouldn't actually you say tougher. it's probably better to be armed? Actually, Tucker, there are data out there that show that if people have access to a gun in their home, it doesn't actually keep them safer. They're at much higher risk for a completed suicide or for a gun homicide, uh, people that have guns in their homes. So, so I there's guess, data to say that your assumption that having a gun in your home keeps you safer, there really are data that refute that assumption. Yeah, I don't think you know the data, really, because when you take suicide out of that, it's a totally different picture. And that, that's a separate question I'd love to ask you about, whether you're against suicide and trying to prevent suicide. But let me just ask you, are you saying that there is no circumstance where someone is safer with a gun? Is that your medical position? No, what I was saying is that in a systematic review published in Annals of Internal Medicine that looked at 16 studies that evaluated the risk of a completed suicide or gun homicide by whether or not the patient, the person had access to guns in the home, that the risk for both those things, a completed suicide and a gun homicide, was higher in individuals who had I'm, access I'm, to guns I'm familiar in their with those home. statistics, and I and they're misleading, and so I'm a little surprised that you're citing them because I think serious people know that. But let me just ask you this: If I said I live at the end, I'm disabled, and I live at the end of a long road where the police can't uh, get there within 10 minutes, there have been home invasions. I feel I need to protect myself. I feel I need a gun. Would you actually say no? You don't need a gun. I mean, what would be your advice? 
I think that's the patient's choice, but if that patient was, was depressed and at risk for suicide or was having homicidal ideation or had cognitive deficits, I would probably counsel them that it was more safe for them not to have a gun than right. to have a gun. Well, I think that's fair. I mean, if, you, if you're worried the person's going to kill himself, I think you're absolutely right. So you as an organization have taken a, a strong position against suicide, it sounds like. Is that right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm no, I mean, not I all, not all physicians, physicians have. There are many physicians that are for suicide. I, I oh. don't think there are too many physicians out, out there that advocate suicide, Tucker. Well, I don't know. Like the entire state of Oregon where it's legal and a lot of physicians participated in it and advocated for it. So, yes, there are a lot of physicians in this country and in Europe who are for suicide, as you know. Tucker, so, but your, your Tucker, group is not. you're talking about a completely different issue. You're talking about... Uh, uh, assisted suicide for people that have terminal illness and are at the end of their life. That really has nothing to do with the gun. Well, debate. I don't know. People shoot themselves with guns all the time when they're in terminal pain or are facing a terminal illness. So you're just saying suicide's okay with a physician but not alone? Is that your position? I'm just trying to get to the nut of what you believe. I think suicide with a gun is always pretty messy and um, it, it, not something that physicians support. And one of the oh. things that's lost in this gun but suicide in with a needle recent okay. conversations. What? Suicide with a needle can be okay, but suicide with a gun is always wrong because it's messy? Is that what you're saying? No, no, it's wrong because even physician assisted suicide is not done with injection drugs. Okay. You're talking about euthanasia, which is not legal in this country. Huh. Okay. Well, you're dead at the end, no matter what. So it doesn't seem morally a different category to me, but obviously you disagree. Dr. Lane, thanks I for thought, coming on. I thought we were going to talk about firearm injury. Well, we were, but the majority, of course, of firearm deaths are suicides, as you said. And so you're trying to protect people from that, again, as you said. So I was just trying to get to the nub of what you believe, because I don't think it's enough just to come on and spew platitudes. I think it's important to explain precisely what you believe and what you mean. And so I was trying to get you to okay, do that. So if if you give me an opportunity, I will. So what this, what okay. this, I think um, I have, I think I, 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 doctor, I think I've given you, I don't know, six or seven minutes. Um, and I think, I, I think you've had a chance to, to explain it. I appreciate it. Thank you. In a new advertisement, the National Rifle Association warns left-wing journalists that, quote, time is running out for them. Here it is. To every line member of the media, to every Hollywood phony, to the role model athletes who use their free speech to alter and undermine what our flag represents, to the politicians who would rather watch America burn than lose one ounce of their own personal power, to the late night hosts who think their opinions are the only opinions that matter, to the Joanne Reeds, the Morning Joes, the Mikas, to those who stain honest reporting with partisanship, to those who bring bias and propaganda to CNN, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, your time is running out. That's Dana Lash, of course, in the ad. She speaks for the NRA, and she joins us tonight. Dan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tucker. So you are being criticized for inciting violence, some say, by that phrase, time is up. What, did, what does that mean? Well, Time's Up, of course, is a play on the Time's Up movement, the Hollywood progressivism that for so long right. tolerated and celebrated people like Roman Polanski and Woody Allen and Harvey Weinstein. But also at the very end of that video uh, there, Tucker, it was an announcement for a program that I'm doing for NRA TV because I think that a free people have the right to hold accountable and to fisk and fact check a free press. And so that's what it's all about. Now, to be clear, I don't believe in universal statements, and that's why to those people, in the media and those people in Hollywood who are pushing propaganda or who are lying. Yes, this is an indictment of you. And the program for NRA TV, which launches at the end of this month, Tucker, is focusing on media malpractice and holding accountable that media malpractice, which we have seen tons of, particularly in the past year. Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think the gut, the gut level animus you see in the media toward NRA, toward gun owners, where does that come from? 
I think it's just, honestly, I think that there are a lot of people who don't understand middle America. I think that they don't understand individuals who are Second Amendment practitioners. I mean, you've talked about this on your show before, Tucker, and I've, I mean, I edited under Andrew Breitbart, big journalism for this very reason. I was entirely fed up with mainstream media, legacy media, and the malpractice thereof. And we saw how they disparaged and impugned the characters of those people, the m members of the Tea Party. We saw them ignore and malign black conservatives. They ignore and malign conservative women. Um, they ignore and malign.